it's wonderful to be able to speak to the head coach of the University of Utah women's gymnastics team, Tom Farden. He has vast experience as a coach, having worked at Southeast Missouri um, and Arkansas previously. Uh, to his credit, he has three NCAA champions that he's coached, 77 All-Americans, and the University of Utah is renowned as one of the top consistent teams within the United States. Uh, on the team have previously been members of, of the world and uh, uh, Olympic team members who uh, compete at the University of Utah. Thanks so much for being with me, Tom. Thanks, Les. Appreciate you having me on. Um, very kind of your introduction, unnecessary, but thank you very much and happy to be here today and help in any manner I can. Yeah, it is great to have you. And maybe you can just talk a bit about how you got into coaching. Well, you know, coaching is, is one of those, it's, a, it's kind of an esoteric uh, occupation. When you tell people you're going to be a coach, oftentimes they look at you like, is that a real occupation? Isn't that just kind of a gig? And I remember when I told my dad, I, was, I had gotten my first uh, assistantship at a high school. And I said, hey, you know, dad, I, I think I want to coach for a living. And, and he says, you, you, make, you make money off of this? You actually think you're going to provide for your family? And, and uh, he was an electrician. Uh, and so really didn't grasp that concept because it, it's, I think a lot of people equate it to perhaps uh, being in a band. I'm going to be in a band. Well, let's see how far this goes, son. Uh, but got my start in high school coaching. Um, you know, I was a gymnast during that same time. So really, while I was a team captain, when I was in gymnastics, I, I started peer coaching because that's something that you just naturally gravitate towards. It's, it's oftentimes in, in gym settings, as in a lot of sports, um, you can give one or two insightful corrections. Um, and because the coaches are maybe perhaps a little bit spread out or didn't really see why that arm bent on that exact skill. And so that's kind of where I started catching on. Um, shortly thereafter, like I said, I started coaching the high school ranks. Um, then at the club ranks, I owned a gymnastic club in the, in the Minneapolis area. Uh, fortunate enough uh, to have a couple of athletes go, to, go on to some Division I um, opportunities and scholarships. And one of the coaches eventually just said, why don't you coach college? And uh, it was at that time I, I kind of started the, in the late nineties, my journey to where I'm at now. And so um, that's how it all happened from yeah. former quasi decent athlete to quasi decent coach now. Right. So, and you're humble, but um, before the coach had mentioned you know, why don't you try your hand at, at college coaching? Was that a thought in your mind or was that an aspiration or not really? You know, I always looked at the NCAA coaches as, as such a, a, a higher level and, and um, you know, kind of the, the trailblazers for uh, gymnastics and, and the gold standards and techniques and, you know, refining their skills and, uh, really getting the kids that are absolutely polished. And so I never really thought it was going to be attainable. And so uh, it, it, like a lot of logical things in life, it moved in a progression uh, where I started coaching and then really enjoyed it. And then by sheer luck and happenstance, I, I got to be around some of the brightest minds in the gymnastics world. I mean, in the, in the entire world, uh, some, of the, some of my mentors and close friends are simply the best in the business. And so uh, through all of that, I, I, do think it, I do think it kind of permeates um, to finally getting to be a college coach, which I never set out and said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to be at a, I'm going to be at a, you know, the head coach at the University of Utah, uh, one of the most renowned NCAA programs in the history of NCAA gymnastics. That was never the thought. Right. So it, it sounds like part of your success was, you mentioned, simply the good fortune of being around great people. Is that the case? Yeah, I mean, I think um, success uh, is, is two parts, right? You have, to have, uh, you have to be incubated with the right people around you, being influenced by the right people on you, aspiring to that stuff. Um, but then oftentimes in coaching, um, time and time again, what I see success um, as far as why a person is successful is their personality and yeah. 
that's often the, in my opinion, sometimes the greatest determinator if, if one, of my, one of our athletes is going to be successful. Yeah. So in terms of kind of just going back to coaching, and I'm curious kind of how you ended up getting your first position at Southeast Missouri. So I, I was uh, an assistant at Southeast Missouri and um, 2003 had rolled around um, and my boss has had left and departed uh, to, to uh, pursue other opportunities. And the athletic director at the time, I was, I think, 27 or you know I was pretty young uh, maybe 27 or 28 but um they had said hey you know we'll let you apply if you want to apply uh we've got some other really great candidates um and so it was a funny story because I'm not sure they really wanted me to get the job but they gave me the interim job and and basically you know you got a coach for your life and it was pretty exciting I mean you're so young you don't even know so uh, you really run through a brick wall like the one behind me. And, and um, they gave me the interim title. Somehow uh, we wound up with the most wins that we ever, we'd had in, uh, um, you know, 10 years. And then in, within two years after that first year, we had made the NCAA tournament and, and uh, that hadn't been achieved for like 20 years. So I'm not sure how it all happened, but it did. And, and um, that's, that's how I got my start at Southeast Missouri uh, back in 2003. Well, and you mentioned that point about personality, and I'm wondering kind of what role would that play maybe in your success as a coach and also in terms of what it takes to be successful as an athlete? Well, personality is, is the root of how we operate and, and how we respond in a lot of uh, different situations. Um, beyond your personality, uh, I, I think it's important to try to figure out uh, – you know, what motivates, what makes people, what makes that person tick. And so, you know, I, I really appreciate working around people um, that, or working with athletes that have a chip on their shoulder. Uh, those are oftentimes the ones that I work with the best. Um, and so once I figure out they have a chip on their shoulder, my next step is to figure out how big is that chip. Mm -hmm. And those, those are the things that I, I constantly look for. Yeah. Would, would you say the athletes that have the chip on their shoulder that they respond well to challenge or difficulty? Yeah, they are relentless in their um, pursuit of proving people and proving themselves. Yeah. And, and sometimes that's ego based. I, I, I understand that sometimes it's ego based, but sometimes it's just so it's just um, solely based on the fact that they want to be great and they want to take it to the their absolute best. So if they had a setback like an injury and they have to come back from that, then their sole mission is, can I get back to where I was? Yeah. And, and so it sounds like the athletes that are successful in coming back from an injury, that they have a very linear or narrow focus. Would that be an accurate statement? Yeah. And, and um, I, I think they're, they, they oftentimes, they're not always type A, but they they are always somebody who has that kind of tunnel vision, especially during that time that they're trying to come back. Um, they're just so diligent and 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 thorough. You know, a lot of the athletes that come back and come back really well from from injuries are very thorough people. Yeah. Would would you say, Tom, you notice differences in the effectiveness of some athletes in in their recovery or ability to return? Some maybe are able to get back at a high level, others maybe less so? And, and if that's the case, what do you attribute that to? Well, some people naturally can get back to, you know, a very, very high level because everything worked out medically. Their surgery worked, worked out medically. They had the right, tendons, the right tendon strength. Their ligaments weren't overly damaged. Um, you know, so there's a lot of things that go into that. Sure. Uh, but, but um, yeah, there, there, there are some athletes uh, naturally gravitate towards getting back better than others based on a lot of very var uh, variables but in terms of what's inside of here or what's inside of here um, some sometimes though you see athletes that are, are extremely driven here or here uh, in their heart uh, but they still can't come back because uh, the ligament that they use the cadaver that they use wasn't wasn't good enough or, or had broke on them or had to go in for a repositioning on the ACL. And, you know, yeah. So would, it's not would perfect you, science. 
Sure. W would you say then, like in terms of that question again about why or what you could account for the effectiveness of their recovery, that certainly there's kind of the medical or physical side and, you know, did the surgery go well? What What's their healing like as, as an individual? But then also some internal factors uh, to them as an individual, whether it's personality or you mentioned the chip on the shoulder or kind of that narrow focus. Would that be accurate? Yeah, I mean, let's say you have two athletes. Both of them had a common injury, unfortunately, in gymnastics. NCAA gymnastics is an Achilles tear. Mm -hmm. Both of them had Achilles tear. It's a tendon. We all know you can make a tendon stronger. The surgeries were both successful, but athlete A got back to her level. As a matter of fact, got as good, if not a little bit better, and athlete B, 70% of her ability. Okay. They both got back to competition, but one really never got back there and one did. Um, I, I actually have lived that at the University of Utah. One of, one of our athletes tore not one of her Achilles, but both of her Achilles. Oh. And at, the, at the same time? No, she tore one one year and the other one the next year. Goodness. And I watched that athlete outperform the other athlete, athlete B, who tore only one Achilles, but never came back to all of the events. So she was able to do what we call the non-leg events, which is balance beam and bars. And the athlete A, who tore both of her Achilles within uh, you know, a, a year and a half time frame of tearing both of them, came back to do all four events as good as she ever had done them, became the Pac-12 all-around champion, all-American. And I mean, just re remarkable. But she was, she, you know, I, I don't know if she'd appreciate this or not, uh, but she was she was the John Deere of gymnastics. I mean, just to work. I mean, she never stopped. And and her chip on her shoulder. She was an adopted Asian. Yeah. Somebody who who lived in a for orphanage until she was five. Um, you know, and 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 life was, wasn't easy for her. No, no, had vivid memories of the orphanage. You know, yeah. and, and I, I'm an orphan too, but. I don't have vivid memories of the orphanage. And right. so, um, yeah, her story was, I mean, just incredible. And, and to this day, we still stay in touch. She's a full grown woman and an adult and adulting and, you know, yeah. but I'll, I'll always remember that athlete for not tearing one, but both Achilles tending at attendance. And then after that, becoming a Pac-12 all around champ. Right. And you use that term remarkable. And I mean, it sounds like that's a perfect description or apt for what she was able to accomplish. And again, it, you would attribute that to kind of those, that factor of having that drive or, you know, you, you mentioned the term chip on your shoulder. And um, what, what does that mean to you sort of, maybe you can elaborate on what you mean by the chip on the shoulder. Well, they kind of embody that, that phrase, like people, some people say, well, you know, why, you know, it, the word improve always has the word prove somewhere in it. And so she always took that, I'm going to not only prove people, but I'm going to improve. And she lived by it with a on a daily consistent basis. And so athletes that I see uh, with that kind of drive or that kind of chip on their shoulder, uh, they win at everything. Yeah. I mean, they, they win at whether, how fast can you climb that rope? Well, coach wants me to climb it in seven seconds. I'm going to do it in five because nobody told me to, but I'm going to be the best at this. Right. And I'm going to win this drill. And they're just intentional, focused, driven people that they, they don't take their second best for anything. They're, they're going to put their best foot forward for everything you do. The one problem with coaching those types of athletes or coaching those athletes uh, through rehab that is common with me um, is is their patience is very low and limited. They they never they're very they're not very patient people. Oftentimes, um, you you have to provide them kind of an aerial view uh, because they're they're just so intricate and just you know involved in making their widget. I'm just right. gonna right. So so would you say that drive? I mean, you mentioned they're intentional, they're focused, they're driven. It sounds like that can be of tremendous benefit in attaining a remarkable recovery like what you described, but can it also be a double-edged sword? Yeah, I mean, anytime you're that type A, um, you, you, can, you, can, you can be intentional 
but you also, those people are so driven on coming back, they can come back too fast. Right. They, can, they, they uh, will push themselves too much to the point of fatigue um, and possibly injuring themselves again. Um, this is the same athlete that was pushing it too far on her little scooter. You know, she was going too fast on her little scooter, wanted to get this, wanted to do that. And she fell on her scooter and tore open her stitches and had to get restitched where her Achilles tear was. Yeah. So again, do I absolutely remember all of the things that she accomplished as an athlete? Yeah, but I also remember the other side where she was pushing herself too much, going too fast, working through things, whether she was getting her laundry done or whatever it happened to be that day. Um, you know, she was so task orientated. She didn't take the proper steps on, I need to be safe. It could be a little slippery out. I'm on my little wheeler with my Achilles. She slipped, fell, and, and, and re-tore open the, the stitches. Oh, yeah. So how, how do you as a coach kind of moderate that intentionality, that drive, that desire to do more rather than too much rather than not enough? You got to keep them light. Those type of people, you've got to have humor involved. Make them laugh a little bit. Make them feel like, yes, they're human. And, and allow them to make some mistakes along the way, you know, to have some minor setbacks and, and tell them that it's okay. I have to, you know, at this level of coaching, um, we've been very fortunate, we've been a high performing uh, women's gymnastics team for 46 years. And, and um, my job, a lot of times, obviously there's a technical aspect, but the other aspect of my job is taking the pressure off of these kids. And so I find myself working with these, these level athletes and, so, and the way they're so tightly wound that I have to pull, pull them back a little bit and let them, you know, be just be a, be a 20 year old, right. Aspiring person and, and know that they're going to make some mistakes along the way and take the pressure off them from time to time. Right. So to that point about pressure, I'm wondering what are some of the challenges that the injured athlete experiences uh, specific to the injury itself or their recovery? What are some challenges? Well, you know, the challenges with injured athletes, it, it, it obviously, it goes with a lot of things in terms of the scheduling of the, of the injured athlete with getting all of their appointments done, making sure they can balance their work life because they're, they're expected to be a student athlete, right? So they've still got to maintain being a student athlete, but now on top of that layer of being a student athlete, going to their classes, they've got a whole nother layer of doctor's appointments, treatments, recoveries, nutrition appointments. I mean, all of those, all of those plates have to be spun for their recovery to go the way they want it to. And yeah. so, that's one of the first things that happens is the explosion of their, their scheduling and their calendar. And, and they like things tight and they want to know what's going on on a daily basis. But all of a sudden, these other appointments are all there and have to be attended to as well. Yeah. So that's an interesting point because, you know, typically one might think of injury as, oh, well, there, now there's a lot of open-ended time. But you're suggesting, particularly for the student athlete, that they then have a whole new layer of things that become added on to their plate, not less necessarily. And, and so is that something that is difficult for the injured athlete to then kind of balance, you know, the nutrition and the physiotherapy and with, with their scholastic um, endeavors? I, I think it is a challenge. And the other thing that happens is they're used to going at one speed, which is, mm -hmm you know, they're, they're, they're high level division one athletes. It's, it's, it's a, it's a quick pace, but yeah. now let's say they have a leg injury and it's Salt Lake city. This place is beautiful, but we do get snow. They've got to crutch through all that stuff. So all of these things just add more layers of anxiety on top of these kids. Yeah. Um, and it's something that I actually talk to the athletes. If it's a lower, if they, if they broke their pinky, I'm not, probably not going to have this conversation. Okay. You're, you're not going to be able to eat with your chopsticks as fast as you yeah. want it to but, but if they did something like twisted an ankle, hurt a knee, hurt their hip, and, and they're immobilized in the lower part of their body, it's something that I, I coach them through their time management because it's going to take them longer to, to get the classes, to get their tutoring appointments, to do their doctor appointments, their therapy, and everything else. It's, it's yeah. important to me because I try to prep them with information. That's my job as a coach to prep them for the things that I think are going to come their way. Right. So when they have that knowledge or that preparation, 
about what may come their way, whether it's, you know, thinking about, okay, getting to class is going to take you an extra 20 minutes or half an hour. That helps them in some way, I'm assuming. And, and if so, how? One of the top attributes that high level athletes need to know is that there's a plan and that your coach has a plan and that your coach is, is, is uh, technically competent. Well, part of my technical competence is training them and teaching them about all the scenarios and variables that could come up. Right. You know, much like I train my kids on when I'm getting them ready for championship season. You know what? Sometimes in championship season, there's a light over the bars that you just don't like. And so what do I do? I make sure that there's a light over my bar area that they just don't like, or there's some loud music all of a sudden, or, or the music gets shut off during the floor teens. I mean, all of these stuff, all that stuff is done in preparation for competition, but it's also in, t in preparation for them to expect the unexpected. And so if I can tell them this information about, Hey, listen, your schedule is going to get blown up with all of this stuff. Uh, you need to be prepared for X, Y, and Z. Right. Uh, it's my it's my duty to 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 give them a warning so they they can k kind of start thinking about it let it let it marinate for a little bit and then be prepared because that that's one, another thing that I notice with the level of athlete that I fortunately get to work with is they're very uh, they want to have a plan they want to know the plan and they want to be right. that want that plan to be communicated to them it's very right. important is that all the more important in the case of injury knowing the plan the progression the you know, imagine time is a primary focus. Clear support for the athlete when they're coming back is critical. This is your athletic trainer. This is your physical therapist. This is your massage therapist. These are the recovery leggings you're going to wear. This is the, you, you know what I mean? Like, what, what are we doing? Let's type up this program. On my laptop at any given time, I have rehab programs in the gym for every body part. Minus, you know, maybe if you injured your ear or something like that. Right, but right. everything else, I've got programs that we design for every minute, for every minute of the day that they're in there. Right, right. And and so, you know, it sounds like they're used to really sort of having that structure and that routine. Would you say that's then sort of helpful to then carry that over into the rehabilitation experience? Helpful and expected at this program. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's kind of just part and parcel of what you expect is that they're going to maintain some type of regular schedule routine with their training and their, yeah. And um, in terms of, you mentioned anxieties, and so I, I want to just touch back on that point. For the injured athlete, what are some uncertainties that they may have? Well, they always have the usual ones, you know, when am I going to come back? How long is this going to take? But some of the ones that they don't necessarily always think about is, is, is um, uh, how, how, how is it going to hurt if I try this skill again? I mean, those are, you know, those are some things that are deep rooted. So once they start coming back to it and they actually start doing that skill again, yeah. uh, perceived pain is, is a, is an anxiety. The length of time that they're training is an anxiety. Um, earning their spot back in the lineups. If they were in our rotation, like I'm out of the rotation now, how am I going to get myself back in? If let's say it was a sprained ankle, when is coach going to trust me? Um, and some of those things are predetermined, right? Like if it's an athlete who is, let's say a world team member, Olympian, we know their track record. We know that, you know, they bounce back quick from some of this stuff. You know, we're probably going to give them the benefit of the doubt. If it's somebody who's, this is their first sprained ankle in their life. We don't really know how they're going to respond to the new added pressures of, landing or taking off with a with a let's say a sprained ankle or coming yeah. back from one yeah you mentioned pain and i'm interested in that point in particular uh, you know what are some things i guess that um the athlete um finds painful obviously there's the physical pain of, of the injury but you said that i think some athletes are able to kind of manage that differently or um, maybe you can elaborate on, on the relevance, I guess, of pain and in, in recovery. Well, I, I think there's a pain, there's physical pain that we all know, right? Boom. That's painful. That's painful. That's physical pain. But I think an underlying pain that a lot of people don't realize with athletes that are coming back is an emotional pain. Yeah. It's an isolation pain. They're not in their normal group. They're not necessarily traveling with the team. 
um, you know, to competitions because they're on, on crutches and we don't want to crutch them through the airport or whatever. Um, so a pain that's, that's invisible to many people is the isolation pain and, and almost feeling forgotten syndrome. And so one of the things that we do to alleviate that is we do travel our kids. Uh, I am involved personally with the recovery as the head coach. I think that's very important. 7 a.m. away trip, you, me, and a couple and an athletic trainer, and we're gonna go. We're gonna go get some recovery on, and we're gonna do this. It's important to me. And it's always been very important to me to be involved um, as the head coach in some aspects of their recovery, so they don't feel that isolation. Because as a head coach, look, I, I get to work with my my roster is not very big. Our roster is not very big, which I'm grateful for. But if we have one down athlete, now I'm I'm gonna take some personal time out and make sure that one, I keep my connection with that athlete. And, and two, that I, I'm, they feel that there's an investment from the staff. Right. So what, what happens if, you know, like say an athlete tears their Achilles tendon and it's right before the Pac-12 championship or a national championship. And you mentioned that, you know, the athlete still comes to the team. What happens if the coach says, you know, coach, it's just too painful psychologically. Like I was supposed to be in there competing now I'm not. I just don't think I can sit and bear watching my teammates compete. How is that handled? You know, we've been fortunate. Uh, all the athletes, we we did have an athlete who tore her Achilles before the national championships, was able to come to the national championships. She still wanted to be a part of the team. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we finished runner-up that year uh, 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 in Pac-12 champs that year. Um, and, and, and she wanted to be. So I can only relate this to one athlete who did right. tear is right before the NCAA championships. She wanted to be a part of that. If, if there was an athlete that didn't want to be a part of this, we would involve our mental wellness team. We would yeah. involve some team meetings with that, that – not a team meeting, an individual meeting with that athlete and vet it out a little bit more. It would be really important to us that, that we know why she doesn't want to come with us, sure. uh, why she wants to kind of remove herself from this. Uh, because, you know, she – she already paid the price of competition. She already, she already w lived through a, uh, you know, a preseason with us and, and was selected in some lineups and this, that, and the other, and yeah. uh, was already invested. So for her to turn the faucet all the way off, you know, we want to know why. And, and, yeah. and be a, maybe a red flag for us to work with her with our mental wellness team as well. Yeah, sure. Um, you mentioned that, you know, there's certainly being in a top NCAA Division I program, you have access to individuals and resources as members of a team. I wonder when the athlete gets injured, to what extent are they involved in communication with different members of that treatment team? Or are they involved in all communications or how involved are they? Yeah, I mean, we, we feel that they need to be involved in that those services, they feel those services uh, from our from us all the time. So constant check-ins with the athletes, incredibly important. Trying to put your arm around them and show them that you care and pr continuing to tell them about the opportunities um, and, the, and the resources that we have here. Uh, that's important to us. So um, some, some are a little bit more bashful and and some some never need it like one of our the, the one athlete who tore both her achilles she never really sought on any help but we always told her that we were there for her right for, I, it's definitely based on an individual but we sure. want to make sure the kids know that they're there and for the the, the programs that are working at a uh, 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 division one programs or division two or division three that maybe don't have those resources um, you know, the coach really has to wear a lot of hats in that case where yeah, Southeast yeah. Missouri was me and one other coach. We still had injuries at that school. How do we motivate our kids to get through that stuff? Uh, you, you, as a coach, you're, you're, you're going to have to dig deep uh, between your staff, whether it's one, you and one other coach or you and that part-time athletic trainer who maybe is a graduate assistant. Um, but you're, you're, you're going to have to be resourceful and creative. Right. So depending on the type of program you're in, you may have to, it sounds like, assume more or less roles. But um, I also just wanted to touch on that point about uh, that I thought was really interesting. It almost sounds like it's the perception of the availability of support that matters more, perhaps, than the actual support. So, you know, you mentioned this athlete who came back from the Achilles, and it's like, she, you know, she didn't really want or seek it out, but she knew it was there. And it, am I correct in 
that that's what's important in, in, you know, if she wanted it, she could get it. Yep. They, they've got to know that we're doing everything we can to help them with their comeback and that right. we're a hundred percent behind them, that we're the main tent pole for their recovery. And if they know that, and they feel that sometimes that's enough. And they, those athletes don't reach out to all of those different individuals that we actually have. Yeah. Uh, but, but yes, I mean, I, I think that's I think that's the uh, that can be said for a lot of things in this world that they know that those resources are there for them uh, at their disposal and some will take them up on you and some won't. Um, it depends. It, it again depends on the the person and I and I think it takes a lot for uh, a lot of the athletes that we're luckily get to recruit here. Very prideful people, maybe have some you know a good level of ego and confidence and that that kind of thing. And, and they may not want that stuff, but you have to offer it to them because you never know which one's going to strike a chord with them and they'll actually take you up on it. And yeah. it might be the small little thing in the equation that gets them a hundred percent back. Yeah. W would you say, and, and you know, maybe this is of course specific to the experience you have working with injured athletes, that there's some reluctance on the part of the injured athlete to indicate that they're, you know, compromised in some way, or I don't know. They're vulnerable, vulnerable because, or, yeah, those athletes are already vulnerable because they're perceived as weak because they already got hurt. So right now, right there, they're already feeling weak. Now I'm going to go see a sports psychologist or I'm yeah. going to go see a nutritionist or a therapist, another type of therapist. Yeah. Well, how much more do I put, what are the optics of I'm showing my team if I've got to get all of this and I'm hurt and so they're, they're at a very vulnerable and fragile stage. And, and it's important that you, you've got, again, so many times with the level of athletes that we fortunately work with, we've got to take some of that edge off of that. We've, you know, we've got to let them realize that they're just human like the rest of us. And pride should be taken out of the equation of your needs. If it's something that you need, remove pride and, uh, and fulfill the need. Yeah, so it's, it's important or there's benefit in the athlete kind of taking their pride out of the equation and just getting what they need to help their recovery. Is that right? Yeah, but easier said than done. Right. And so in terms of, I guess, to the point about helping them or, or doing, so to speak, the uh, business of effective recovery, you mentioned that term care. And I wonder if you, you could elaborate a bit more on what that means to you and how you demonstrate care for the injured athlete. Well, care is something that you have to build a relationship around. If you want to, if you want to get something, you know, like it's my job to pull the best out of these kids. I'm, I'm just going to say that right now. I'm charged with winning championships here, period. Like I get it, fully embrace it, understood it, yeah. adult decision. But you build your entire relationship around care. When they're injured, you still care, and you show them just the way you always had. You know, constant communication checking in with them, whether it's a handwritten letter, uh, meetings with them. I mean, just that, that's the one thing, especially with teaching female athletes. The, the one thing that I, I, I know we've got to build strong is a good, strong uh, foundation of a healthy coach-athlete relationship. Yeah. And, and that involves a lot of communication. Um, and, and, you know, at all of our practices, at all of our meets, I start with a meeting and I end with a meeting. And when I main meeting, sometimes our meeting is 30 seconds long. It's one minute. It's the priorities for the day. And then I recap things with what I saw during that practice. Same thing happens at a meet at our competition. You know, it's, they, they want to know feedback. High level athletes need feedback, feedback to them, positive feedback to them is caring. Yeah. So, and it's a, <coughs> that that relationship sounds critical to everything you do. Would that be fair to say? Yes. Yeah, yeah. The relationship uh, with, without it, you won't go very far. You, you're yeah. going to get far better results when they're injured, when they're in the highs of highs, when they're not feeling very motivated because motivation undulates. Yeah. You, if, if you have a built in relationship with them, you can have those challenging conversations uh, when they're injured and you've already built and established a caring relationship with them. They know that when you're pushing them, you're doing it for the betterment of them whether whether it's the betterment of them getting back from the injury or the betterment of them you know 
uh, uh, getting through the emotional drain and and the um, you know the disappointments. Right, right. And in terms of that point about motivation undulating, would you say that's also the case in terms of an injury recovery? Yeah, oftentimes when they're first mot- when they first injured, uh, motivation is at an all time high. I'm going to really get through this, and then the grind sets in, <laughs> and they're like, "Hey, wait a minute, this is a year recovery," <laughs> and so when that grind comes along, that's when, you know, motivation has really got to dig deep and, and you, you've got to keep, you know, restoking the fire per se. Right. Uh, and so you know, I see it all the time, you know, and it's natural. It's natural as a human being. I don't know if any of us are, are, are at our very best at a motivated level, 100% all the time, 24 seven. There sure. might be some people out there. Yeah. So how does the injured athlete restoke that fire? As you say, when, you know, particularly in the case of a long recovery where maybe, let's face it, the exercises are tedious or maybe painful initially, physically, just, yeah, boring. How do you stoke the fire if you're the injured athlete and you're seven, eight months into an Achilles or ACL recovery? The injured athlete, the supporting cast, and the coaching staff have to have great enthusiasm for the smallest of victories. Yeah. I mean, it is, yeah. it is the cure to so many things. Enthusiasm, genuine enthusiasm is, is an unbelievable cure for a lot of ailments in sports. Yeah. So celebrating those small victories. And I guess in terms of a progression of recovery, what might, I'm thinking what might be some of those small victories that the athlete could celebrate or be genuinely enthusiastic about. I mean, so, I, Achilles kid, let's just say Achilles kid, because it's, it's a year long process and I've, I've watched it enough. You yeah. know, the first thing that the, the athlete's going to do is they're going to have a successful surgery. And with an Achilles tendon, it's not like an ACL where you have to let it come down for a month and a half. I mean, I've seen that happen where you've got to let the swelling come down in that knee. And it sometimes takes four to six weeks before they can even go in on an ACL. Um, you know, Les, you know, you tore your ACL. It takes yeah. a long time for them to even yeah. go in and, and, and start poking around down there. Yeah. But Achilles tendon, they're in surgery one day later, or they can be because it's a tendon. Um, so there's your first victory. They got their Achilles tendon. It was success, successful. Their next victory is going to be when they get their stitches out. Then the next victory is going to be when, when they get off that little wheelie cart that they ride around. And they're actually on in a boot, but they're on crutches. Then their next one's where there are no crutches. Now they're just in a boot. The next one's when they get to wear a real shoe next to their other, other real shoe. So they have two cute shoes. Yeah. Uh, that, those things are important to girls. Like they, they want their shoes to match. They care about what their feet look like. Right. To women, excuse me. Um, and, and so those, those, I just brought you through the first, you know, 12 to 16 weeks of, of an Achilles uh, tear re- uh, recovery. And, right. and you can find those every couple of weeks, every two to three weeks, maybe four weeks. You can find those small victories to celebrate because you know you're on your way to where you were. Right. And so I'm guessing the attainment of those milestones or goals, whatever term you want to use, then has motivationally beneficial properties or is enhancing for the subsequent motivation to get to the next milestone? Well, yeah, I mean, in the sport that I, I work with, um, everything is based on, in, in most sports too, but it's a thousand to learn, 2000 to master a skill. And, and so it's, it's, it's in their brain, it's etched in their brain that things are done numerically. Okay. Well, this week I did this many toe lifts and then I get to remove the shoe okay well that that makes sense so they logically can tie those two together oftentimes you know in in, like i said earlier uh logical things move into progression so logically these athletes are going to categorize i've done these men this many repetitions on this specific exercise that's going to help me to achieve this right kids uh our athletes can compartmentalize those equations in their brain and realize I'm making progress. And if you were a gymnast at the level we recruit at, you you know what some of those repetitions, uh the meaning of some of those repetitions to the end the end result are. Yeah. And so I think that's a great point. The the fact that it's not just about kind of getting certain milestones, but it's that 
they know that attaining certain things is then connected to the skills that they're needing or wanting to be able to perform, right? So there's sort of that link or connection between those two things. Like, okay, now that I can do this with my ankle or knee, whatever, that will enable me to better perform this particular skill. Is that right? That's exactly right. Yeah. Because they can make all, they can connect all of those dots. Right. Okay. And so it almost, to your sort of analogy about connecting dots, would you say then like being able to see all the little steps on the path to recovery and to visualize it or articulate it, that that's important for the athlete or those around them to be able to sort of help them see that path? I, I think so. I, I think, like I said before, uh, it's so important to me to to uh, lay out the plan with the, my athletes at the beginning of the year. We are in a 15 week cycle. We break it down into uh, four um, uh, micro cycles on that, and then within that, we break things down within a week cycle. So yeah. we have a load day, we have a build day, a load day, off day, a build day, a load day, and then we have a kind of an active recovery day. I mean, they know our exact training pattern and it, it takes a while to get used to it that they know exactly what is behind it why we're doing it we explain all that stuff and i expect our athletic trainer our physical therapist and the people who are working with our recovery including myself to have those same explanations and quote unquote roadmap for their recovery as well right would you say the roadmap is a linear one or is it you know what what should the athlete be expecting is it sort of more curvilinear, up and down. How would you describe that, Matt? Circuitous? I don't know what other adjective to throw. <laughs> uh, circuitous, that's a good one. <laughs> it's not exponential, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> like all injuries. Um, you know, with, with the roadmap, you know, the one thing that we always tell them is it's like life, right? I mean, you're going to have some setbacks there. And, and um, the, I know our athlete, going back to our Achilles tear kid, she didn't, our athlete didn't try to have to have stitches redone on her Achilles tear uh, scar. I mean, that wasn't intentional. It was an accident. Yeah. It was yeah. a setback. That right. was a couple of weeks setback because why? Because her stitches have to be out for so many days before we can get her in the aqua jogging pool, right? I mean, I've got so many aqua jogging workouts, it's ridiculous. <laughs> but that set us back, you know, a couple of weeks because now yeah. we've got to wait for these stitches to dry uh, and, and to be all healed up and sealed up before we can reemerge her to the pool where yeah. we can start using those large muscle groups right. and, and, and the lungs again. So there's a setback you didn't expect, but it was there because of X. Yeah. How do athletes, and again, maybe this varies from one athlete to the next, but do you notice sort of tendencies in how the injured athlete handles those setbacks or when it's not like, well, I thought it was going to be four weeks. It's turning out to be a little bit longer than that. How do they handle that? The stronger they are here, the more stubborn they are, the better they handle it. Yeah. And, and if they're not handling it, I guess, well, as a coach, then to all those things that you talked about with like communication and that all then comes back into play or? That's where we have to step in and offer that support for them. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we recognize that too. And, and um, you know, they're not always going to – Nine times out of ten, the eighteen to twenty-two year old young emerging, you know, young women and emerging adults, they're not going to come to you. You you have to be a little bit of a dentist and pull it pull it out of them, pull pull that mm -hmm. tool a little bit to get it out of them. What's going on? Let me know how are you feeling about this setback. And um, you know, their their initial response is they're gonna I'm fine. And then you gotta you gotta dig a little bit with them. But again, that goes all the way back to what's your relationship with that athlete. Right. And, and I, so obviously, or I shouldn't say obviously, but I would imagine that when you have the good relationship with them that, and you get to know them, that maybe it's easier to pull the, the tooth maybe a little bit, uh, or, you know, maybe I guess there's behavioral indicators uh, uh, of when they might not be feeling great with their rehab or those kinds of things. Um, you've talked about drive, and, and I guess we talked about motivation but i just want to come back to that is is the reason why the athlete is recovering is that important to their recovery or is it really just about kind of how much motivation they have does it matter why they're yeah. coming back 
sometimes the reason is greater than their, than everything else. And, and sometimes it's just because they're intrinsically motivated. I, I think if they had a reason to come back, if it was, you know, I got to get my spot back. My parents really expect me to, I want to win this. Perhaps that's kind of some extrinsic motivation. Uh, if it was, I want to be back because I want to prove to myself that I can do this sport again at the level that I was at, I'd, I'd consider that more intrinsic motivation. And right. I think the waif between the two of those, and I think they're both beneficial. I mean, they're both, you know, obviously the internal motivation is the one that burns, you know, it's kind of like coal, it burns long and it's, it's hot and it's just kind of there and it's gritty and it's dirty, but it's there all the time. And yeah. the ex extrinsic one's kind of like burning some pine wood, right? It flares up super pretty, very bright right away, maybe hot, but as we all know, pine burns quickly and, and could be, you know, exhausted in a, in a few weeks, but. Yeah, so to that an your analogy, Tom, given sort of the long, slow burn of the intrinsic motivation, would you say that that's almost a prerequisite or needed to um, an effective recovery? And I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, I, I don't think it's always an effective. I, I don't think it's always a, a, a pre-qualifier. Um, I've seen kids who their intrinsic motivation isn't that big pile of black coal that just kind of it's yeah. just there, right? Yeah. But they're a freak athlete. That injury wasn't as bad as what we thought it was because they're a freak athlete and they're so hyper talented. Their extrinsic motivation pulled them through their uh, three and a half week recovery. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so, in terms of uh, just a, a few more questions, and yeah, I very much appreciate and, and love the insights you're sharing. It's great. Um, in terms of decisions about when the athlete is ready to return, how do you know when when that's the case? Well, obviously with gymnastics, there's a lot of tests leading up to it. And thankfully in my sport, there's a lot of logical progressions that the athletes have to attain before we'll let them do it. Let's say they come in back from a broken hand. Well, I know that at the bottom of a strong G, the, the G force at the bottom of a giant on a strong spar swinger is seven G's. Like I, I know that. So we're going to test other things outside of that to see how close we can get to that before we actually let that athlete swing around the bar without her hand slipping off and right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so same things in a lot of other, you know, a lot of my other, you know, the other events that I get to coach is there, there are things, there are load tests that we can make before we can do this. And so through science, data, research, we've been able to come up with, for most of the injuries we've had, because um, we haven't, I haven't been experienced to every single injury in gymnastics, right. uh, but I, I can, we have some uh, logical benchmarks made through either load bearing or some other measurements that we know that the athletes, you know, or a progression or a drill or a lead up drill, or, or a similar skill that we know that athlete's most likely going to be ready for this skill. So we communicate with our athletic trainer who doesn't have the gymnastics and technical ass expertise, uh, but has the medical expertise. And then also our strength coach who, Hey, you know what? She's her, her load is X. She should be good to go and, and handle that landing. Great. Here's where she's at. Uh, here's where she's at at her blocking point. The arc of her hips are at six and a half feet. I really need to see him at seven and a half feet before you let her land it, blah, 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 whatever. The right. equations are all there, but with consultation from our athletic trainer and our strength staff and our, and our entire staff. And what happens to all of that when, let's say, there's a big competition and, you know, you've got your all-star athlete and, you know, you know they're going to help the team, or they could be pivotal in the team's success. How, how does that criteria, those physical benchmarks, how does that fit into the equation, or does it? Whether they're a bench athlete or a or a uh, star athlete, in the litigious litigious society that we live in, it's absolutely imperative that every professional out there adheres to the standards of safety first. Yeah, and so. The, the main consideration is, is are, are they, you know, like physically, there can't be sort of knowledge that they're putting themselves at risk for further damage. Is that right? They've got to be physically, emotionally, and mentally ready. Right. How do you assess whether they're emotionally or mentally ready to return to play? 
Um, well, I mean, you know, the return to play is, is, is again, a lead up. It's, it's not something that happens overnight. And so yeah. we're, we're going, they're, they're, they're not going to be, at least at our program, they're not going to all of a sudden Friday look really good and then Saturday, hey, you're in, let's just yeah. do it. No, they're going to they're gonna have some proving points and, and, and we're going to make sure that they're going to be able to execute the skills that we need them to execute um, in the manner that we need to execute them, whether we're doing some simulations in the, in the gym or, or however we're handling it. But um, some, some type of mock performance has to occur before the real performance. Right. So I, I like that idea because it's sort of like, it's not just like the rehab ends and then the next day they're competing. It sounds like there's still sort of benchmarks or certain criteria you mentioned and, and sounds like it's very specific you have you know data and information relevant to particular injuries that they need to be able to show proficiency in is that correct yeah and yeah. and in that is there also some sort of like i guess behavioral observation or some discussion with the athlete if they're feeling apprehensive or it's like well okay i i noticed they're you know they're not quite as decisive as they need to be in that movement. Are those things that kind of factor into the, these return to play decisions or not necessarily? Yeah, they are. And, and thankfully in NCAA gymnastics, uh, we, we compete six, but in most NCAA competitions, they allow you an exhibition. So like an unattached runner in track and field, you know, we're allowed to compete another athlete uh, that will be judged in front of your fan base um, or in a pose, at an opposing school, you're, you're allowed to compete that athlete uh, without counting uh, towards or against your team score. So uh, one, of the, one of the great things that our sport did many years ago, and they're, they're not the ones that get shown on TV, you know, that's after the rotation's over and, and the judges just judge, so you don't get to see them on TV. Right. Uh, but you, there are athletes going and just showing the judges in front of a crowd, in front of their team, in front of their coaches, hey, this is where I'm at. Or maybe we use that exhibition. It's actually called an exhibition spot. Maybe we use that for an athlete who's not injured, but really pushing those other athletes for a lineup spot. And she outscores the other kids in lineup. Now we have justification as a coach to slide her into a lineup spot the following week. Yeah. So it sounds like there's real value in having that exhibition spot, whether it's for the injured, you know, the uninjured athlete trying to prove themselves perhaps, or the injured athlete who maybe just needs the opportunity to perform in front of a crowd or, you know, at an event. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, we talked uh, a little bit about this, but would you say there are any benefits to an injury? Yeah. I mean, I think oftentimes we're all injured right now. I mean, it's, we're, we're living in a COVID uh, pandemic and uh, we all had something taken away from us. Um, I had the ability to go into the gym. It's my happy place every single day and, and, and go to my office every single day. And so I do believe much like what's been taken from all of us right now, uh, when your sport is taken from you and, and you, you thoroughly love it and enjoy it, uh, it, it, is a, it is a reminder, uh, sometimes painful, sometimes a harsh reminder of how much you actually love that sport. Yeah. And, and, and uh, in gymnastics, it's a feeling of flying. And, and I'm so old now, I don't remember competing, but you know, that, that was the one thing that, you know, once it's in your blood, it's in your blood. Yeah. Well, and yeah, I imagine for the gymnast, there's real joy in that freedom or sort of the ability to do some of the amazingly challenging and complex flips and, you know, and, and, you know, all of the different elements of performance just to move in those complicated and challenging ways that obviously when you're not doing, um, I imagine could be significantly missed. Um, so, and, and there's benefit to that you're suggesting because when they come back, how does that impact them? Right. Well, I mean, I, I think as a, po as a person, you, you've got to try to remain as positive as possible. And, and if you have a setback or you have an injury, uh, that effect of missing out on something uh, reminds you not to take uh, your sport for granted. Right. And, and the thing that you love, or, and, and all of us, most of us fell in love with our sports at a childhood. So our feelings and our emotions tied to that sport are extremely deeply rooted because we, we fell in love with that sport at such a young age. Yeah. 
So kind of maybe if they have sort of renewed conviction or they get back in touch with the things that they love or miss about the sport, for instance, when they were young, um, that that then has maybe behavioral implications kind of once they get back that maybe they're willing to do the small things or, you know, is that accurate or? Yeah, I, I definitely feel like once they get back and they're, you know, 80, 85, 90, 95 percent back to, uh, you know, healthy. Uh, I think they soak it in a little bit more. Yeah. I think stay in the moment a little bit more. So many times when you're hundred percent, you're full speed, you're so exhausted from training. You're, 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 you're tired of your coaches talking to you about this, that, the other, and then we've got this training plan and nutrition and it, all of that information is flooding at you constantly. And, and it's, you feel like that hose is just wide open all the time. When the injury happens, the hose kind of stops. You're isolated. You're away from the group. And then when you come back, it's a slow process coming back. And so the hose is open back up on you slowly. It's, it's right. not a flood right away. And so they process things a little bit differently. They yeah. think through things. They're able to live in the moment a little bit more. They have a little rehab sheet and then a couple of assignments, but they're still in the gym four hours. So what am I going to do for that four hours? Well, I'm going to do what my coaches told me for all these lead up drills so that I can eventually do my stuff. And, you know, they've got all this, these rehab stuff that they're walking around and, and, and a little bit of us, uh, uh, you know, trying to figure it out by themselves, working with their coaches. But a lot of times uh, they do, they are off by themselves a little bit. And, yeah. and so during that alone time, they they can they can really dive into things and and as you said not skip steps soak things in and live in the moment a little bit more yeah um would you also say that you know you mentioned just the flood of information that they're getting or you know like imagine the training is not only long but at times quite intense and you know all the things they're normally facing when they're competing when they have the injury is is maybe one of the benefits just a chance to recover or get rest in some way from all of yeah, that. Yeah. I mean, we, we had an athlete over the years who, who ended up hurting her toe, but, but because of her, her toe, she was able to rest her back because, because her toe was off a little bit then her back was getting whacked out. And so yeah. it actually gave her a chance to rest her back, her toe and everything else. So yeah. it does give you a chance because let's say it's a lower, uh, extremity ailment um if you're resting that you know obviously you know something else might be getting some rest too and some recovery so right again injuries um they're they're a misfortune they're a part of sport um but sometimes there's always a silver lining yeah okay um just my last question tom if you were to give one piece of advice for the injured athlete what would it be The, the biggest thing that they've got to remember as an athlete is they're not alone. There's a lot of people that who, who, who help them get to where they're at right now and they help them get to where they're at, whether it's their parents, their siblings, their teammates, their friends, their teachers, uh, previous coaches, they all help them get to where they're at because they cared about them and they cared about their trajectory. Yeah. And, and they've got to remember that they're never alone um, sometimes they feel very isolated and I don't want people to do that. I, 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 it, you always hear about the heroic ones, the ones that got back and they did something that was unbelievable. Well, there's a lot of them that, that they gave it all they had and they still never got back to where they wanted to be, but right. that doesn't make you a failure. It, it, what it, what it tells you is that sometimes, uh, the stars don't always align perfectly. Things don't always line up perfectly, but, but never in, in a million years, uh, is the injury necessarily it's not your fault sometimes you can't explain why they happen but they happen and you you just you, you've got to do the best you can to realize that you're not alone in this yeah so getting that support is important and and um you know they don't would you say they don't necessarily need to be stoic or or to feel like they have to put it all on themselves but it's okay to seek out and get the you know assistance of, of the different support team or individuals who could facilitate their recovery. Yeah. Along the way, uh, many, many people helped them get to where they're at and, and all of those people would be more than happy to help them again uh, yeah. to get back to where they were. Yeah. Well, those are great thoughts to conclude our, our discussion, Tom. And again, I really appreciate your time. And I know that, you know, an athlete who listens to our discussion 
I have no doubt will benefit from hearing about your insights, experiences. Uh, thank you so much. Great to speak with you. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot.